Hey everyone, thank you for joining us this afternoon for transitioning from face-to-face -to, -face to an online environment in your calculus course. Um, thank you. We all want to um, introduce our um, speaker for the day, um, Keanda Johnson, who is a uh, senior instructor at Spelman College, is also a faculty consultant for Macmillan Learning. Um, Keanda is committed to encouraging students to show them how everyone can succeed in mathematics. This commitment inspires research and implementation of various pedagogical techniques to reach every student today. Um, welcome, Keandra, and thank you for speaking today. All right, thank you so much, Nancy. And thank you, everyone, for taking time out of your busy schedules, I'm sure busier than ever, um, to partake in this webinar. So again, today I'll be talking about transitioning from face-to-face to an online learning environment in your calculus course. And I'm Keandra Johnson, I'm a senior instructor of mathematics from Spelman College. So I've been teaching um, online courses for about, I would say four years. And in that four years, when I first started teaching online courses, I was really intentional about giving my online students an environment that was as close as possible to my face-to-face -face students. Um, a lot that I'll be sharing today are tips, tools, and strategies that I've learned, honestly, through trial and error. And so I want to encourage some of you that some things that you'll try, especially if you're teaching online for the very first time, some things you'll try will work great and some things might not. So just be very patient with yourself. So first, before we begin, um, I want to do a polling question. How comfortable are you with transitioning from face-to-face -face or in-person classes to online classes? So we'll give a few more seconds. So a quick poll should have shown up on your screen. How comfortable are you with transitioning from face-to-face -face classes to online classes? Maybe about five more seconds. So, Keanda, we've got 19% say comfortable, 50% say somewhat comfortable, and 31% say not at all. Okay, so that's exactly what I expected, not at all comfortable. So hopefully by the end of this webinar, we can say something, give you some type of tip or tool or strategy that will help you feel just slightly more comfortable. So in this webinar, what will we be focusing on? transitioning from face-to-face -to, -face to an online learning environment, it's first important to think about what does your face-to-face -face course look like? What are your desired goals and learning outcomes? And how do you achieve these goals and outcomes in your face-to-face -face course? Well, once we've identified those learning outcomes and goals in our face-to-face -face course, how can we then navigate to an online course? What are some pre-class things that we need to think about? maybe course setup or expectations, expectations from professor to student and expectations from student to professor. How do we adequately communicate those expectations? Next, we'll look at um, online in-class. So you may choose to do lecture videos. So what are some lecture capture tools? We'll review some of those. Um, you may not choose to do lecture videos. And then what type of lecture delivery tool will you use? And then we all want to keep students engaged. So what are some things that we can do to continue to engage our students in an online classroom? And then I'll show you an example of my calculus online course. So first, let's start with face-to-face. -face. What does my face-to-face -face course look like? So in my classes, I want students to follow this diagram. I tell them that, that if they document, which just simply means writing down the definitions, theorems from the book, so reading ahead of time, that that will help class participation significantly. 
So then the students can come to class and they can participate more thoroughly. And when we're in class, then I lecture, we do a few problems. I'll have some clicker questions integrated into the lecture. And because students document it, then they're more apt to participating and they're more prepared to do their homework. And then I strongly encourage them to do, to attend office hours and to create study groups. So in documenting, I use some of Achieve's products. So the learning curve and the guided learning practice. And if you want more information about that, you can feel free to ask later. And then during my lecture, again, I use uh, clicker questions integrated inside of the lecture. But before class, I require students to print off the guided class notes or the PowerPoint slides that are on their LMS. We have an opportunity to work through problems. So I'll do one for them, we'll do one together, and then I give them an opportunity to break up into groups and to do problems on their own. So this would be an example of a lecture or guided notes. I would give them some notes or they would have to go using the ebook to fill in. So you see some of these are given and some of them are blank. So the students would complete the guided notes. We would have some lecture time, go through a couple of examples, and then I give them a clicker question to ensure that they have mastery of the content before moving on to the next content. Homework, so after lecture, then I give them homework and I use Achieve and I like Achieve because it gives the students guided feedback and the students are able to navigate homework effectively and more independently. And then again, I encourage them to attend office hours and um, create study groups with their peers. So this would be an example of an achieve question. So we have another poll. As you think about your face-to-face -face class and how you will transition to online, what is the biggest challenge you think that you will face? So um, some of these I want to kind of go through to give you an idea. So keeping students engaged. So we know it's easier to, well, it's easy to engage students in a face-to-face -face class. So maybe you're concerned with keeping students engaged now in an online environment or maintaining your teaching style. Maybe you created a great presence in the classroom and your personality can really show through in your class. So how do, how do you maintain that? A lot of us may be concerned with academic integrity of students. How do we ensure that students are doing their work themselves? And as we've had some time to transition from face-to-face -to, -face to online, Maybe some people feel a little bit overwhelmed in the amount of work that it takes to create lecture videos and things like that. And then, or maybe it's establish and maintain the academic relationships that we've already built with our students. If it's something other than these five, I would love if you would put it in the chat and during the Q&A time, we'll have an opportunity to address some of those other concerns. All right, so, so far we've talked about the face-to-face -face class and hopefully while I was going through what my face-to-face -face class looks like, hopefully you were able to think about your face-to-face -face class and some of those items resonated with you and you're like, yeah, I do that or yeah, you know, I think that's a great idea. That's similar to something else that I do. And so once you've had an opportunity to think about your face-to-face -face classes, then I think it's a great transition to your online class. So when you're navigating an online class, I suggest that you think about your pre, your in, and your post class. So we see as far as challenges um, with the, as far as the previous poll question and challenges with keeping the students engaged was one of the highest percentages. Yeah, keeping students engaged was one of the highest percentages. So doing the polling, this is a great illustration of one way to keep the students engaged. So you've seen so far in this webinar, we did a poll kind of in the beginning, right? To get everybody warmed up to see what our audience was, to see who our audience was. And then we do a poll in the middle, make sure everybody is still there. So that's actually one great tool that you can use in your class using polling. And I'll show you uh, maybe one or two more in a little bit. 
So pre-class. So when you're setting up your course, a uh, course setup and structure, what should the students expect? So in setting up your course, you should think about, is it going to be a synchronous course, an asynchronous course, or a hybrid? So a synchronous course is where students are learning all at the same time, doing the same activities in a lecture or laboratory environment. So online or distance education that happens in real time at the same time. And then asynchronous, of course, does not happen at the same time. So the students are still learning the same material, but at different times and in different locations. So synchronous learning is also known as independent learning. I choose to do a hybrid um, course. And the reason why I like hybrid courses, because one, again, transitioning from face-to-face -to, -face to online, we've already developed these relationships with our students, right? They're already used to seeing us. They know a little bit of our personality. They have a community with each other. So I want them to continue to maintain that community that we've already created. Also, I'm aware that some students have um, certain difficulties. Maybe you have an 8 a.m. class and you're Eastern time and they're Pacific. So ugh, they have to wake up at five in the morning to attend class. So I think having some asynchronous components of your course would be really, really good. So what should the students expect? If it's a synchronous course, what are the meeting times? It's important that this is clearly defined and outlined for the student and possibly placed on your LMS. And what is an outline of your class time? So what does your class outline look like? Maybe the first five minutes we do kind of, you know, a wrap up, how is everybody doing? How is everyone transitioning? And then the next five minutes we take a quiz, the next 30 minutes we do a lecture. So that's just an example. So what is an outline of your class time? So students know exactly what to expect when they log in to the synchronous course. If it's asynchronous, when will you post material? So if you're posting lecture videos, when will that be posted? Maybe every Sunday at 10 p.m.? That might be a great example because then students know to look at their LMS at a certain time. Posting assignments, when will assignments be posted? And when will assignments be due? So these are all really good information for students to have and have that consistency when they're navigating an online course. So if it's a hybrid course, of course, a combination of the synchronous and asynchronous expectations. Email response rate. This is really important now in an online class. So will you take 24 hours or 48 hours, business hours, to respond to an email? Discussion board, will you require students to use a, a discussion board? If so, what will be the requirements? Maybe the students need to post to the discussion board once a week and they need to reply to one other person's discussion once a week. When will it be due? How will it be graded? What do you expect of them and what is necessary for the student to succeed? So what do you as the professor expect of your students? So this is something to think about. Out of class expectations. Again, when are the assignments due? Will you allow extensions on the assignments? Will it have a due date, but they can turn it in maybe two days after that due date? What are the assignment due dates and expectations? Lecture videos. When they're watching the lecture videos, how should they interact with the lecture video? Should they just watch it? Should they watch it and take notes? What, are, what is their requirement when doing the lecture videos? And then discussion board. So in-class expectations, if you're doing a synchronous course, what do you as the professor expect of your students? Well, what is your attendance policy? Are they allowed to come into class late? How late? What is your participation policy? So do the students have to actively participate? Do one student each day have to do a problem on the board? So what, how will you gauge their participation if you're doing a synchronous course? And then how will you communicate? So these are some of the different ways that I have communicated with students. 
But I do want to warn you, I don't do all of them in one semester. So you have GroupMe, you have social media, you have email, and then you have your LMS. I would suggest picking one, maybe two of these. So as far as the group me, I often tell my students that I'll be in the group me, but I'll only leave a message if it's important or if it's an urgent time. I'm on an urgent timeline. Um, I prefer to communicate with students via email, but again, I would suggest that you pick no more than two of these because otherwise you'll be checking group me social media email <laughs> all times throughout the day and that can be um, a little exhausting <laughs> and what should we expect of the students it's important that we communicate to them that we expect them to succeed so here's an example of communicating expectations so this is a course that i taught online um, in the summer of 2019 and we see here that the students have a clear outline of what's due and when it's due. So this is a course that met Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday. I'm sorry, that met Monday due Thursday. However, we only had synchronous live sessions on Tuesday and Thursday. And the students can see exactly when the homework was due, what did they have to do as far as completing the lecture video. So when thinking about student success, it's important to think about what's pre-class, what's in class, and what's post-class. What do students need to do and what do we need to do pre, in, and post to promote student success? So first, let's talk about pre-class. So pre-class, is it important for you to do lecture videos or class notes? Or a combination of them both? So again, communicating expectations. This is just an illustration of something that I put on our LMS. So I want students to succeed and I want to tell them how I think they will best succeed. So how to succeed in this course. I also want to pause for a minute and have us think about something. So we're new to teaching online courses, many of us. However, many of our students are new to taking online courses and they may need a little more assistance than we think or than we're aware to navigate the online course. So students have told me that this um, information right here has been very, very helpful for them. Us letting them know, the professor letting the student know how to succeed in this online course. So I tell students the suggested daily activity. So look at the calendar every day Look to see what section will be covered. If there's a lecture video, if I'm doing more asynchronous at that during that particular week, and then complete their achieve homework and start all over. And what does watching the lecture video look like? Well, for me, I suggest that students print the notes, watch the lecture video, and take notes on the lecture video on the notes that they printed out. That was a little um, a little much but take notes on the lecture video using the notes that they've printed. Also, I let them know what is my expectation of the lecture videos for them and me. So lecture videos will be posted every Sunday, 9 p.m., and they must be completed by the date listed on the calendar. And then I go on to give them a little bit of advice of what I want them to do on the lecture videos when they're interacting with the lecture video. So <clears throat> let me say this, you don't have to do lecture videos. And I'm gonna talk about a little bit later what's an alternative to doing lecture videos. But in my opinion, lecture videos make a better use of class time because the students have an opportunity to look at the content, look at the information prior to coming to class, especially in a calculus course. And then we can spend more of our time online, working through problems, being put into groups, right and then that will allow the students to continue to work independently and it provides student flexibility so the students can watch it at their leisure they can re-watch it if necessary but as some of us i'm sure have already seen lecture videos can be quite time consuming to create so if you are creating lecture videos 
here are some um, tools that I've used in order to create lecture videos. So you may have heard of some of them. If you know of others, please feel free to put it in the chat. So um, I like VoiceThread because in VoiceThread, it allows each student to make a comment on every slide. So if a student was confused, they can say, hey, I didn't quite understand when you did the problem on slide number five, and they can leave a comment on that slide. Screencast-O-Matic, it just records your entire screen, so it's a great screen capture device. TechSmith Relay allows you to put quizzing inside of your lecture, and it also sends you an analytics report that lets you know what percent of the lecture that the students watched. I love that feature. Camtasia, many people are aware of that. PowerPoint, you can actually record your lecture videos using PowerPoint. Notability, Doceri. So really there are a ton of options and resources out there for us to create lecture videos. At the end of the day, you're looking for something that you can do screen capture. And the awesome thing, so I told you previously that I was using Achieve in my calculus courses, Achieve actually allows you to upload your video to their system and you can make it assignable. So we can, there's just another way to ensure that the students have actually watched the video. So in class, in an online environment. So we can review the lecture videos at the start of class and then lecture, and then we will work through some problems. So in class, if we're doing a synchronous course, here are some tools that we could use to do our um, lectures. So we have Zoom, which we know a lot of people have um, been using thus far. Blackboard has Collaborate Ultra, which has a lot of the similar features as Zoom. And then we have Microsoft Teams, GoToMeetings, WebEx, um, Google Hangouts, FaceTime Live. And again, these are just a few that I've used personally. I'm sure there are tons of others. But for the remainder of this webinar, I'm gonna focus on Zoom because I like Zoom the best. So in Zoom, it has a polling feature, very similar to what you've experienced during this webinar. So a lot of you mentioned that you were concerned about student engagement. Well, imagine that in Zoom, you're giving your lecture, very, very similar to the experience you're having now, but periodically you can insert polling inside of that. And then you can make sure the students are paying attention, that the students are still engaged, and that the students are mastering the content as you go. It also has a whiteboard feature, which is awesome because both you and the students can write on it. So I was in a Calculus 2 course um, earlier today and we were doing a problem and the students were taking turns. So I wrote the problem on the board, I did the initial step, and then I assigned about three students Okay, you write the next step, you write the next step, you write the next step. And then students were able to engage on the whiteboard and still feel like they were getting that one on one attention in a large online environment. Zoom also has breakout groups or breakout rooms. So I'm able to put the students in groups and then they can create their own whiteboard. And then we can go, the presenter or the instructor can go from group to group and consult with these groups. So now we're talking about a smaller environment for the students, maybe three, four, five students at a time collaborating with each other in small groups. Zoom also allows you to see every student. So this is great because it helps me with proctoring exams and assessments. Post class. So once I've created the pre-class, the in-class, and the post-class, then we typically for post-class focus on homework. Now, I've been using Achieve for homework, but I understand that some people may not have had um, some type of online environment for their homework previously. I know that some people prefer to do paper and pencil homework and collecting homework. Well, I will say that um, Achieve is offering a free class set if you would like to demo it or get more information about it. So this semester, you can incorporate an online homework in your course, even at this point, if you so choose. So let's pause for a minute and have another poll. Course structure. 
are you most in favor of a synchronous, asynchronous, or hybrid course structure? So based on the things that I've discussed so far, what do you think is best for you? A synchronous course, so you meeting and lecturing with your students, or an asynchronous course, maybe creating all lecture videos. Or remember, there are tons of tools out there of lecture videos already created that you might want to use, or a hybrid, a combination. Okay, awesome. So I see most people prefer a hybrid. That's great. We have that in common. <laughs> All right, so now let's actually look at um, an online course. So transitioning to online. So I'm so happy that most of you did say hybrid. So because for the remainder of the webinar, I'm gonna focus on hybrid. So I too prefer hybrid, um, synchronous versus, I mean, and synchronous, putting them together. And I think because of what we're facing in our nation right now, I think hybrid is a great solution. Um, it's a smooth transition, not only for us, but for our students as well. So again, remember, students have been used to being in face-to-face -face classes. They've been used to interacting with their, um, with their peers and interacting with us and seeing faces. So having that synchronous component of the course, I think is very important, especially in a course like calculus. Now, there are some other disciplines, of course, where you know it's easy to do an asynchronous course. But in calculus, I think that having the synchronous course is great. And then having the asynchronous component where students can again go back later, watch the lecture videos, see what was said, um, that's important. If I may pause for a second and give a little testimonial, I had a student sent me an email. Actually, I had about three students send an email yesterday. Yesterday was our first day back um, in class online. And all three of the students had connection um, difficulties in the midst of class. So maybe they missed 10 minutes or so. And they all called, well, they didn't call, but they all emailed and, you know, hey, I missed class. I don't know what happened. What did I miss? And I told them not to worry. I recorded the class and I will post the recording of the class on your LMS. So you can go back and watch the class and see the part that you mentioned. So as we're transitioning from face-to-face -to, -face to online, it is very important to think about what are the challenges that our students are possibly facing. So again, I think it's a smooth transition for both us and them. And I even surveyed the students. And believe it or not, they said they prefer synchronous sessions for the reasons that I mentioned. So course structure, then you can do the lecture videos or for the remainder of this um, remainder of this semester, I'm going to choose to just lecture online. So give course instruction online using Zoom. I will record the course, the class sessions, um, where I'll review the lecture notes and work through problems. And I think as the students get comfortable with the online setting, then I'll start to create more lecture videos and have the students to engage in the lecture videos at their convenience. So what is necessary for student success? Again, pre, in, and post class. So this is my calculus course, and this is what I put online um, a couple of days ago. <laughs> so how to succeed in this course? I'm telling students to log into the LMS, to view their calendar on a daily basis, read and complete the, um, the class notes. So we use Moodle at Spelman. Complete the learning curve assignment that's found in Achieve and attend the live class session on Zoom. And then later on, I instructed them that I will start including lecture videos. Then complete the Achieve assignment and repeat. Again, reiterating what I mentioned earlier, then I give them a small blurb on how do you interact with the lecture videos. Here's their calendar. So we see here, that they know exactly what is due when. So they have the learning curve, they know that's pre-class, and then we meet on Zoom for class, and then they have the homework. And they see here 
when they have tests and when they may have a quiz. So commuting, communicating the expectations to our students. This helps them to feel at ease as well. So again, pre-class, I post class notes. So they have a link here where they go and download the class notes. And using those class notes, they then go and do their learning curve as explained in the previous slide. So in Zoom, I lecture as face-to-face -face, um, using the whiteboard feature to work through problems. So I'm gonna illustrate for you, uh-oh. So this is what it would look like in Zoom. I would go to share, I would click on the whiteboard, share it with my students. Now, I prefer when I'm working in Zoom to use my um, iPad, however, or a stylus. However, I am aware that our students don't all have that um, convenience. So what I chose to do in this video is to use my mouse pad to write, because this is probably what some students will be faced with. They may all have laptops, and so I want to show them that they can still use their trackpad in order to write on the screen. We can save it and then email or put this on our LMS. You can save your whiteboard and put this on your LMS at a later time. So maybe this is a problem we were doing in class, not our Cal class, but <laughs> this is just an example. Also during class lecture, I incorporate iClickers. So iClicker is a pre-built question set that's also found in Achieve. So students can access iClicker using their cellular or mobile device. So during class, I'm um, actually, I had class today. So I have students, as soon as they enter the class, they go ahead and open their iClicker app, and it will be similar to the polling features that we used earlier. So we lecture, we do a few problems, I put up an iClicker um, slide, they answer the question, I may give them an opportunity to get into groups using the breakout feature, the uh, breakout room feature, and then come back and repoll. And so doing this sequence of activities, I found that class engagement has been very, very similar to what I would do in a face-to-face -face class. And then post-class, this is an example of a report that I would get from Achieve for post-class. And I can look at this report uh, maybe a couple of minutes before class, and it's let, this lets me see what problems the students may have had issues with, and I know what problem to start my next lecture with. So throughout this webinar, I've mentioned um, quite a few things that you may want more information about. So Macmillan is, well, Achieve, is offering faculty office hours where you and I can explore maybe some features of Zoom or talk about some things that you were thinking about implementing in your class and maybe how it worked for me and just collaborate. Sometimes it's good to just talk through your thoughts with someone else. So we will be having office hours. We can see the dates and times listed here. And um, Nancy is gonna come in in a second and talk to us a little bit more about the office hours options. So right, thank you. Right. So, so we will, oh, go ahead. <laughs> thank you so much for listening. Go ahead. So if you have any questions, um, again, Nancy, and then maybe Andy. We do have a couple questions um, that were put in. So I wanted to just read that off. Um, the first one is, I see the proctoring assessments. Are there other suggestions for keeping the integrity of, say, Calc 2 assessments that are not just multiple choice or typical online assessments? Um, I'm sorry, read the question again. I see the proctoring assessment. Are there other suggestions for keeping the integrity of, say, Calc 2? assessments that are not just multiple choice or typical online assessment. Okay. So other so, assessments other than multiple choice. 
So for my assessments, I actually give them a typical test like I would in a, in a face to face class. Um, I will post the test on my LMS at a certain time, you know, set it to not appear until a certain time. And um, the students can go in and they can see the test just like I would if it was in front of them. I use Zoom to record them while they're taking the test um, so that I can see their entire um, workspace. And then I sent the students a video. Well, I posted it on the LMS of how they are to take pictures of their work and upload it to the LMS. So I still, I'm still grading their work just like I would in a face-to-face -face class. And again, if you want more information about that, I can show you um, the video that I send students or talk to you more about that in office hours. But it works nicely because I'm not doing so much of the online testing. I'm still doing more traditional testing. Great. Um, let's see, we had another question. I'm not familiar with Achieve. Can you provide a quick overview of it? Yes. So Achieve is um, an online platform. So if you've, I don't know if you are familiar with maybe WebAssign or My Math Lab. So similar in structure to those. And it has a great platform set up to where it's pre-class, in-class, and post-class activities already set up for you. So for instance, the learning curve that I spoke about previously. So the learning curve that I spoke about, so those are already created in Achieve, and then I can just go in and assign them. Um, the homeworks is similar to other online environments where you can pick your individual problems. Um, the guided learn and practice, that's another feature that's similar to Learning Curve that I use as a pre-class to make sure that students have documented and have read the text before coming to class. Um, and then the eye clickers, that's another feature inside of Achieve, the eye clicker questions. So they, provi they provide um, curated questions already and they are great questions. You know, they're really thought provoking questions I love. I've used them in Cal 1 and Calculus 2 um, in both of my classes and they help tremendously with the class participation and making sure that students are staying engaged throughout the lecture. And again, those are all things that are found inside of Achieve. So I know Achieve um, one was is interested, if you're interested in finding more, um, they will be doing, uh, well, they're offering a free class test right now and they're willing to do demos and things like that. And also I can help you more on how I use it and how I set up my course um, in the office hours that we mentioned. Hey, thank you. And if there's any other questions, please uh, feel free to put it in the chat. And we'll make sure that Keandra. Um, hey, Keandra, it's, it's Andy. Uh, and, and hello, everybody on the call. This is Andy Dunway. I'm the director of math and statistics at, at McMillan Learning for listening in. One, thanks, Keandra, for, for walking us through how, you, how you've kind of navigated, you know, moving um, your courses from, from face to face to online. Um, and, you know, I know, I know you've, you've had uh, some, some, some runway in, in front of a lot of other folks that are, you know, in this time of sort of crisis across our country and in our higher education system, having, uh, you know, oftentimes being forced into moving their, their content online. Did you want me, kind of, did you want me to show live, um, uh, sort of achieve, and then you can talk through real quickly those elements? I, I, again, I, I want to be respectful of people's time as well. Um, are there are there elements that you guys would want to see? Just feel free to pop it in the chat. We can we can jump in live really quick and just show you some of the ways in which it may enable uh, a quicker time frame in moving from face to face to online. We tried to to pre build and curate um, you know uh, uh, most of the content that that we we would have assignable inside the platform and can show real quickly you know, what that looks like and how we, how 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 you all might be able to get access to that to evaluate it to see if it may enable you to move and make that transition quicker um if if people want to people want to see it andy i think that would be a great idea okay so you have uh control there you go uh are, is everybody seeing my screen yes keandra yes. and nancy are you guys at least saying yes it? yes yes cool. <laughs> So Keandra, if I just jump into like chapter two here and show, you know, sort of the course, the course plan. So guys, when I, I logged in on the left nav here, you can see sort of so where, where you can you can go around inside the environment. 
Um, if I would have built assignments, they would have shown up here. What I'm jumping to is, is what we call our course plan. And again, one of the things we've tried to do, particularly in this time of need where people are trying to transition these courses from a, a traditional face-to-face -face setting into an online learning environment um, overnight is, is develop sort of this course plan idea, right? And so this is a pre-curated pathway where we've gone into the environment and tried to select some of the best of the best content in there. Um, and like Keandra said, but particularly around how we know faculty have, have sort of set up their courses in the past, which is, you know, what do I want my students to have before class? Uh, what I want my students to have during class and then, and then what kind of content and interaction in a digital learning environment do I want them to have post class. Um, and so, you know, as I'm in here on chapter two, Keanu, as I flip through, you can kind of talk through some of the things that um, that you use. So again, um, I'm in chapter two. I'm now breaking this down by section. So this is this is following our Rogowski calculus uh, textbook. Um, we also have the same exact structure for um, Mike, Mike Sullivan's um, calculus textbook. Um, yeah. But but again, you know, basically by section, then we break we break these things down, right? So um, you know, one of the things Counter mentioned was reading. You know, so you can assign reading. Um, so if you really want students to to spend time in the textbook, um, you know, they they can go in here and you can assign this as a participation grade, right? So that they actually have to go in, they have to click through the pages, they have to interact with the pages in order to get participation for for completing that reading assignment. Um, you know, here again is another pre-class element that we have, learning curve, and, and Keandra, I know you're a big user of learning curve, and this has been a big part of your class, both in the traditional setting and in, in, your, in your fully digital classroom. You want to talk about learning curve and what it does for, for you and your students? Yes. So for learning curve, it's basically a content-based um, environment, so it is adaptive. And the reason, um, well, I like that it's adaptive because it allows students who may already have a base knowledge of that content to get through the topics more quickly and students who need more focus on that content to give them you know the the attention that they need um you can set the target as you saw previously you can also set the topics so again this is just it's not really um students working through problems it's testing the students knowledge of the basic information so when I said I prefer students to document ahead of time, then I want students to go to the book, write down the definitions, theorems, and I found that learning curve helps me to ensure they did that. So once the students are done, right before class, I'll go into my grade book and I can see something like 86% of the students have completed learning curve or have met the target. So then that helps me because I know, okay, great, at least 86% of my students are prepared for class, they've read and interacted with the material, um, and they're ready to go. And that 86%, it will only give the students a pass if they met the target score that I outlined, not just if they just click in the system. So they would have to get, if you notice over to the left, it says score 15 out of 30. It won't, yep, it says score 15 ah. out of 30. It won't, um, I mean 300, sorry. It will not actually give them a complete until they meet that target. So if it says 86% of my students have interacted with the learning curve, that means they met that 300 point target. So it has increased my um, class participation significantly because I'm spending less time writing definitions and things like that and more time actually discussing the definitions and the concepts and what do they mean for us and interpreting them and then doing problems applying them. So as Andy scrolls down, you can see there's also guided learning practice. Guided learning practice focuses more, I would say, on prerequisite skills as well as content. So it will ask the students questions about skills that they would need in order to do well in this next section. And so you might run into interactive figures where they can actually engage with the, um, with the graph and that's powered by Desmos. So that's great because the students don't have to download an additional software in order to access it, or you'll just see like similar to what we just saw. So that's skills that students should know coming into this section. Um, there are also some in-class activities 
which um, I think those would be better for a traditional class and maybe not an online class. Um, no. I don't have any experience using them in an online class. Um, and then you have your homework, which I showed previously. Also in um, Achieve, you can download the set of iClicker questions. There's a set of iClicker questions for every single section in the calculus sequence. Um, and then I'll I'll jump in here on this one, Kendra. So th what I'm showing here, guys, is this is the the you know the view sort of into the math assessment engine that we've built that powers achieve, right? So that we can grade calculus the way uh, most faculty want to see calculus graded, right? So so I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time just showing you the palette and how how easy easy it is to get math into the environment, right? So when we designed this assessment tool, um, you know we wanted to ensure that that our environment wasn't getting in the way of the mathematics, but enabling the mathematics. And so you know a lot of what uh, you'll see here, you know, is watch this 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 palette. It's it's super super clean and easy to use. You'll notice that the buttons will adjust um, so that students don't have to go digging and diving for particular buttons. That um, based on the type of expression or the type of mathematical uh, question we're asking, those buttons will surface to the front of this palette uh, so that the students don't have to try to go in and navigate it. But but more importantly, and one of the things that we focus on just based on student um, feedback. Was, was keyboard and short, shortcuts and, and being able to help students navigate that, right? So I'm just on my keyboard right now typing, you know, two pi, um, you know, I put an E in. If I do um, shift six, that gives me my superscript. Um, you know, if I want to get out of that, um, here I'm just typing square root. It's going to give me the square root. So the way a lot of these students use this, want to use this environment are these keyboard shortcuts. A lot of them have some some basic level of knowledge of coding. So like th this is a this is a you know a place for them where th these shortcuts make getting the math into the software so much simpler and easier. Um, and all those shortcuts are always here for students inside of this as well. So if they go to to the help, um, our it explains our keyboard navigation, which is also fully accessible um, for um, uh, in, in, you know ADA compliancy. Um, but it also gives shortcuts here so you can see all the shortcuts that exist inside of the environment that students can come in and type in and, and sort of easily get their mathematics into the software and not fret with with how how they, they get some of these complicated um, calculus expressions into the environment um, you know the other thing that's that really differentiates the assessment tool that we built and kind of alluded to some of this in the beginning is is the specific wrong answer feedback right and I think this is particularly important in a time where they, they don't get a lot of face time with you and so the, the way we designed the power behind this assessment tool was was to sort of tr try to provide an office hours like experience as students are are going through their homework, right? So so this this part of our platform is a very formative uh, part of the platform, right? From an assessment perspective, so we want students to learn as they go through the assessment. Um, so you know what what you'll notice here is if I put um, this answer in here, uh, which is 81 with a superscript of two over three, and I check my answer, the software is gonna give me some feedback that is specific uh, to my wrong answer. And, and just for demo purposes, this is why this assignment looks this way. Obviously, we wouldn't tell students <laughs> what incorrect answers to place in there. Um, this is just so that me as a non-mathematician uh, can easily show um, how the platform sort of adjusts to common misconceptions we know students have while they're in our environment. And so you can see here it says, you know, Andy, you may have not correctly evaluated the limit. Um, you know, you may have reversed the roles of the numerator and the denominator of the fractional exponent. Um, now, if I come in and I, I try this again and I change this answer to just nine, you're going to see that the feedback changes, right? So again, I have not correctly evaluated the limit, but you may have only partially evaluated the fractional exponent. And again, recall that this this is you know x p over q equals you know the, the the representation of the expression that we're trying to get for them to solve for this limit um so you know and then if my answer is way off and it's not a misconception that we think we've programmed into the environment um we all we have generic feedback for all questions right so if i were to put in here five and check my answer you'll see the feedback's gonna change again. And it's gonna say, hey, Andy, you need to go all the way back to the beginnings of this, right? We can't identify, or the, AI, the light rate AI that's running can't identify you know, the misconception that you have. So let's go back to the beginning and let's walk you through this. Um, you know, it's different than you know, just providing students a red X uh, or, or a green check if they get it right. 
or it's also different than just sort of regenerating problem over pro after problem after problem. What we hope to do is to really identify that misconception they have while they're going through this particular problem, address it in the moment in sort of a just-in-time teaching way, and then progress them through to having better understanding and comprehension of this particular problem. Um, at all times, um, they can get to um, their textbook or the Desmos scratch pad here. Um, and they also can, if they, if they give up, uh, um, they can always see the solution. So if I do give up on this particular question, it will show me the exact solution for this particular problem uh, and the steps in which to solve it. Um, so the full solutions for every single question in the environment are always there for students. Um, you'll notice uh, I have three of infinity attempts here. So as you build your course, um, you, can, you can put as many attempts as you want on there for students. Um, you can also limit it. Uh, you know, a lot of times uh, we, we will have faculty that will want to limit the number of attempts so that students aren't just clicking around in the environment, but really having a focused assessment experience in here. Um, you can you can deduct points for wrong answers. You can leave it completely open. It's just how you want to set up your your particular assessment uh, program for homework. Uh, it's flexible to do that for you and with you. Um, just a couple other things. Um, you know, again, uh, one of the Oh, so 15, so getting some of this, this um, geometric stuff in, so theta will auto, auto uh, translate into theta, tangent. Now, one of the things I want you to notice here, so, so this auto-populated this, this parenthetical for me, and I don't know if you can see that on my screen, but, but it, there is, again, in this formative assessment environment, we know and we have watched students interact in here, and they often make really simple uh, mistakes around syntax and syntax error and inputting the math into the software. So, you know, things like closing out a parenthetical so that the software doesn't mark you wrong for that, right? We, we kind of prod them and push them in this formative assessment environment to remember to do these sorts of things, right? So if I type theta and again, uh, it's, you can see it still hovering there. It's kind of giving me, hey, Andy, don't forget to close out that parenthetical, right? I can, again, check my answer. It's going to give me some feedback based on my wrong answer. Um, and then, and then, you know, I can try again. Uh, one of the other cool things that it'll do, uh, if I try this question again, and I just say plus 15x of a secant subscript squared. Ah. It's gonna tell me, hey, Andy, uh, your, your, the, ah, I didn't put a plus in, sorry. Um, I should have put a plus in there, but the first thing it recognizes is that I used the wrong variable, right? So X is not a variable that was given to you in this equation, in this particular question. Uh, make sure you go back and, and look at that first, right? So again, it's noticing that that part of what my expression was was not part of the expression in the question that was given. Um, so again, simple things that we know students make, and particularly again in this online environment that become really frustrating and ultimately become emails to you guys in your inbox. We're trying to alleviate a lot of that stuff by, by providing these sort of simple mechanisms in the assessment tool to remind them to not make these simple mistakes. Um, let's see here. It's another wrong variable one. Um, this one uh, is, is pretty cool. If I were to just put in here negative infinity comma zero, so this is before a student even submits, right? So you're seeing this orange bar here. This is a warning. So in, uh, in some of these syntax errors, before a student submits and before they make the mistake that we assess as wrong, we want to prod them to, again, hey, this is a very simple thing. You put a comma in, comma in your expression here through our software. Make sure that you put a parenthetical in or it's going to mark it wrong, right? So I can go back in and put the parentheses in. And that's prior or before submission. Um, you know, again, uh, one of the, let me see, I'm going to get out of here and show you, um, a Desmos question that we've built. So like Keandra was saying, um, Desmos is the, um, the graphing tool that we've embedded into our learning environment. Um, I don't hope, I'm assuming almost all of you, there's 26 right now on this call, um, have seen Desmos in some capacity. Um, it is by far and away the most um, widely used graphing tool uh, in, in mathematics, um, but we've been able to do some pretty cool stuff with it. Um, so um, somebody mentioned Calc 2. This is obviously a question from, from Calc 3, um, but if I come in here and 
open up one of the guided learning practices that Keandra was talking about earlier, which is bringing a lot of sort of interactive elements to it. Um, they're, they're, it's both it's both a, a coverage of the um, algebra skills students will need to be successful in some of these instances, but it also is some of these really cool dynamic interactive figures that we've built. Um, so you know, here's one that's looking at the path of a particle. Um, you know, I can move this around. Uh, as I move this around, you're seeing it's plotting points. Uh, I can actually grab it by uh, this viewer here, and I can spin it around in three dimensions so that students can see this in a pretty dynamic way. Um, I can always do this too to see just one path of the particle in three dimensions. Um, you know, these, if I grab the view and I put it here, it's telling me that's the YZ coordinate. If I put it here, it's telling me that's the XZ, the XY. So again, students can kind of come into this environment and then and then play around with this to see, um, you know, these, these different interactive figures that we've built using the Desmos tool. Um, I can also always change my view. So if I wanna see my environment stacked or side by side, I can do that here. One of the other cool things is we've got, you know, 250 of these dynamic figures built into the environment. Um, and so we actually talk students through what they should be paying attention to here within this and sort of how to use it. So again, what's cool is like, not only do we have these questions in here, uh, or excuse me, these interactives in here, but we wanna find out and assess whether students took from the, the interaction with these particular figures, what we wanted them to, right? So we can put, provide questions in here that students would answer, that again, they're scored and graded and, 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 and then sent back to you as an instructor to see how students are performing based on um, their interaction with these, these types of figures. Um, we also have uh, some, some tools in here we call Calc Clips, which are um, basically lecture uh, whiteboard style videos. Um, let me see if I can find one of those real quick. Uh, but there's about 250 of those as well. So again, I know as you guys are trying to ramp up and find digital content that you can get in front of your students in a very quick way, um, you know, some of these tools are, are great assignable things that, that you can provide students. Um, so let me see if there's one in here. Um, well, Andy, while you're finding that, I just wanted to also mention to everybody on the line that you will receive um, the available times for um, Keandra's office hours. You will also receive the recording from today and um, an option to have a one-on-one -on -one demo on Achieve, if you would like. That will come to you um, after the session. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, just real quick, so just to show you a couple of different ways that assessment isn't just open responses in our math assessment tool or multiple choice, but we do have some of these drag and drop questions that students can drag the appropriate graph into the um, uh, into the, um, the the one that describes the properties of the graph. Um, so again, I can I can you know check my answer here, and it tells me that at least one image has not been matched correctly. I'm um, gonna hear some great feedback on what might not have been um, done correctly. Uh, let me see here. So that's another dynamic figure. Um, again, where students can interact with this and, and see the slope of the line as it changes and goes through the graph. Uh, let's see here. Um, and I, like a lot of people that are working from home, have office buddies that pop in my office every once in a while. So uh, my daughter my daughter just came in uh, to my office. I'm gonna finish this really quick, sweetheart, though, and then I'll be with you, okay? Uh, so. Here is again uh, an opportunity uh, that you can see, you know, how our authors are helping students navigate some of these problems that are in, 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 um, you know, from straight from the textbook, uh, and and now in this environment for them, right? So, um, again, placed with assessment around them, uh, so that there's a, a sort of a pathway for them to get better understanding about some of these basic concepts that we we provide them through the guided learning practice. Um, I don't know if you guys probably can't hear that through um, through your screen, but there is a, 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 an author talking and then handwriting on this screen, um, you know, 
the basically how to solve the critical points of of the particular function in this problem. So again, we're up on time. I I, I don't want to take up any more of this and quite honestly didn't intend to get this in depth into this environment <laughs> on this call today. It was really about more of the pedagogy of moving your class um, you know, from a face-to-face -to, -face, uh, to an online environment. Um, but like Keandra and Nancy both mentioned, um, you know, for the rest of the semester, um, you know, one of the things we think we can help with is, is to provide this stuff um, to you guys uh, and to your students um, uh, for free uh, as, as we, we do what we can to enable um, you know, our country and, and, and the higher education system uh, in in what is a, a an awful time and a, and a crisis um, that that you know this is this is a role we can play uh, and so for anybody on the call that that is interested in taking a deeper dive as Nancy mentioned we're gonna have uh, plenty of opportunities for you guys to learn more get trained look at look at this this content and and see whether this can help you guys um, get your courses to where you want them to be um, for your students in this online learning environment um, but but please uh, please take advantage of this if if you see it as as tools that can help you. Um, we're happy, happy, happy to partner with you to help you guys and help your students um, navigate the rest of the spring semester. So, great, great. Thank you so much, Andy, and thank you so much, Keandra, for uh, the presentation today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We'd like to continue to help you. Um, like I said, you will be getting an email with um, office hours, a recording, and an option for a demo. If there's anything else we can do, if you get um, access to a chief for the rest of the semester, we're happy to do that as well. Please just respond to the email and we will take care of that. Thanks so much and have a wonderful day.